Hello and welcome to the second panel of the inaugural festival, inaugural edition of the Nehru Literature Festival. If you've just joined us, um, I have a few housekeeping rules to share with you. Before that, let me introduce myself. My name is Kartika. I'm the anchor for this evening. I'm a part of the festival organizing team. We will have a panel discussion beginning shortly um, on the topic of boundaries on the edge, boundaries within. It will be moderated by the author, Siddharth Verma. Um, during the panel discussion, we will be launching a few polls. You're free to interact with these polls. We would love to get the audience's responses on it. If you have a question, please do type it out in the Q&A box um, and we will respond to you and we will share a few questions with the panelists as well. So without further ado, let me introduce Siddharth Sharma. Uh, he's an author, he's a journalist, he's a historian. He's written several books, including Year of the Weeds, The Grasshopper's Run. Siddharth, over to you. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, we have, uh, we have Rinchen, she's, she's worked uh, in Chhattisgarh. She's, she's a writer, she has, uh, she's written for children. Uh, we have Ejaz Khan, uh, he's a director. And uh, we have Kenny Basumutari. Hi, hi, Siddharth. Kenny, are you there? Hi. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> hola, hola. Okay. Hi. Uh, and Kenny, who's joining us from uh, from Kohati. Hello. So. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll we'll begin with uh, with Rinchen. So uh, Rinchen has uh, has been working in uh, Chhattisgarh around uh, the Riker area. Uh, she's worked a lot with children, and that's that's one thing that we'll be talking to her about. She's also written uh, for children, including uh, the Trickster Bird, which is which is about how people are displaced. The people of a, of a particular community are displaced. It's also a story of uh, of traditions of, uh, of of folk uh, tales. And there is also I will save my land, which is uh, which is about. Uh, uh, a struggle for uh, protecting indigenous land and indigenous heritage. So, uh, Rinchen, you you have you have worked a lot with indigenous communities uh, on 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 various issues, including with with children. So, how has the experience been, and how how did you uh, how did you happen to arrive there? Um, I think for. Um... Almost for two decades, I've been involved in people's movement, and it is slowly um, uh, my involvement in development issues and understanding the inequities that exist in this world and uh, uh, working with uh, movements and communities. I think uh, it's been a long journey uh, through which uh, one has sort of understood and uh, I think reached a point where you where uh, you also understand that uh, while on one hand we know and we see that inequities in the world exist. I think when we were most of us when we were growing up, we knew that the world uh, was unequal. But uh, to a large extent, sometimes we don't see the see our own com uh, complicity or see how these inequities are created because uh, they don't just happen. Like for example, whether it is inequities based on uh, race, on uh, gender, or on caste, these are created. And uh, I think uh, while uh, growing up, uh, the more one read, the more one uh, saw uh, things around. And for me, it was a, a large part through literature, uh, because we weren't having these kind of discussions at home or even around. But it was through literature that uh, one started to understand and uh, also see that there's a world beyond the cocoon, comfortable world that we lived in. And it was that, it was that uh, I think, uh, curiosity and also the need to understand it. And also, uh, once one understood it and saw that how uh, uh, the role that uh, certain communities play in uh, marginaliz marginalizing other communities, I think, as a person, as a woman, once one, uh, when one understands marginalization, then um, on sexualities, when one understands marginalizations, and then you realize that beyond you, there are other marginalizations that are happening 
to other communities and slowly through working through interacting uh, i got involved in people's movements people who were fighting on uh, for their rights and uh, that is where i am now largely uh, that's been my life for 20 years and i think it's very different from the life that i grew up in and um, so and I, I i feel privileged that i am i am able to do the kind of work that i am doing Does that yes. answer your question? Uh, so when we talk about it does, it does, it absolutely. I have I have followed your work for the longest time and I've I've been a big fan of uh, of I will say my land. Uh, so uh, a question that, that that occurs to those of us who have read your uh, who have read your writings and who have followed your work is uh, there is this perception uh, that indigenous communities are in the news or are remembered by uh, people in, in the big cities only when uh, when they are looking for the exotic or when there is a conflict over uh, natural resources but uh, the, the lived experiences the, the the rich and vibrant heritage and uh, the the other issues which are there uh, don't get mentioned as much yeah that's true and i think uh, not just exotic, but as we were discussing earlier also, uh, to a large extent, the perception is uh, one, exotic, sometimes very negative. And um, also, um, even in terms of when people talk of conflict, uh, most of the times our understanding of why that conflict arises is not, uh, is not clear to a large extent. Sometimes when one hears about and I think in urban areas, when people hear about uh, protests, movements, uh, children wonder or uh, people wonder, Ki kyu, kyu, uh, agitate kar rahe hai? Ya, why are people um, protesting? Why are people protesting against uh, takeover of land? This is for development. This is for the country. And uh, what, what, uh, what doesn't come out is that the development and the way that our country is developing is very skewed and so in when uh, large tracts of land get taken over for say mines or for other larger development projects which we think um, bring pros prosperity there is a very large section of population that loses not just its land but also its way of life so whether it is in terms of language whether it is in terms of culture in their songs that is not represented enough and uh, also, that is uh, seen as like, I, I don't know how it is now in schools, but when we were growing up, there used to be this, there used to be these dances that would happen. So there would be a Rajasthani dance and a, um, say a Gujarati dance and an Adivasi dance, whatever that means. And you had, um, and I'm speaking of, I'm speaking of schools that are like government schools where people would just wear, um, uh, they would wear grass cuts and make, nails out of people wearing grass skirts and making nails out of paper and uh, that would be that would be the representation of adivasi culture in mainstream or uh, so i think uh, that needs to change and the more uh, more people read or there are more stories that are not just uh, related to urban india or urban upper class upper caste india i think the more understanding there will be also of the different worlds that exist and also now there are a lot of younger and older Adivasi writings which we never get to know of or we never hear of it sometimes that effort is also not made to uh, procure that so um, I think uh, that is also something that will change this perception looking for a work and um, and that culture is not always written. The languages will not always have a script, but that is something that needs to be discovered and uh, not just discovered, but preserved. And there is a movement that is going on for that. We need to support that movement. Right. So you, you mentioned that there is, there is an increasing body of work on on these issues. So if, if you were to recommend some literature for, for particularly our young viewers who would be interested in getting introduced to these issues beyond what is uh, what is mentioned in textbooks 
uh, which uh, which books would be a good way to be introduced uh, to the issue? Um, I think uh, there is, um, of course, uh, um, one of the first works that we had also all read, I think who was known who is herself, not an Adivasi, but Mashweta Devi, who had written extensively. And that was one that brought struggles, lives, uh, many questions into, um, into our lives. The other, I think, is the young young authors like Jacinta Kerketa. Uh, there is uh, Hemant Talpati, um, Ruby writes books that are coming out of Adivani. I think a lot of those that uh, those can be accessed and uh, read. Uh, I think they're making a list also later, and I can also provide a list. But uh, uh, th there is a lot of song. I think. Um, th um, I don't know if uh, many kids uh, have heard it, but there's a song that is very popular and that video is going around in our area a lot called Gaon Chodab Nahi, Jungle Chodab Nahi. That's a small video. It's a song uh, uh, written by Ramlal Maji, which is about the struggles. But it's not just about the struggles for saving the land, but it's also about the connection that uh, they have with land. For example, the whole concept of God is very different. Uh, the, the fact that nature is that um, right now we consider them um, a lot of the indigenous communities are um, are uh, by default considered to be Hindus, but they have a religion that is different from like say the institutionalized religions that were there so that uh, i think a lot of that there are a lot of folk tales which have their own power a lot of times we don't consider folk tales and the written folk tales as um, as bona fide literature but i think there is a lot that is there uh, so I think uh, there are collections taken out by Sahitya Academy, which is the Sadhana Tales, and a lot, lot of these uh, collections of uh, folk tales and stories of different tribes. I think that also is something that the young readers can read. So, so these would be a good way to be introduced to, to the subject. Right. Uh, Rinchen, you've also been working with, uh, with young people around uh, Raigarh and in MP. Uh, so what are you working on with them at present? I think um, there are two parts to my life. I think one is that uh, I'm a part of a union that works with uh, where we work with uh, worker on workers' rights as well as the people that are on human rights. That are, uh, and largely where I live is where uh, people are fighting against the environmental degradation of large coal mines. So a lot of my time actually goes into um, helping people fight legal cases in courts, uh, whether it is against larger corporations uh, for polluting their water, for causing health uh, effects, for polluting land, and also for the illegal takeover of land. Then there is the Forest Rights Act, which where a lot of people, the Adivasis who don't own land, but have been cultivating forests. So their right to forest, um, there is a whole struggle for people. There is a law, but then there is still a long struggle for people to um, uh, have that, uh, to get uh, entitlement over their land. So a large part goes into organizing and working with that, that as a lot of paperwork and running to and fro between courts. But uh, the nicer part is the cultural work that we do or like run libraries. And uh, we have a collective called the Ekara Collective that also makes films. And uh, it is films, uh, people uh, acting in the writing, acting are all people from amongst us. It is not, um, they're not uh, necessarily uh, mainstream actors. And this collective has made three films. Yes. Two of them are children's films. One is Chanda Ke Jute, which was written by a small young girl of her first experiences of going to school. And how when these young Adivasi girls who were migrants from Chhattisgarh but into the city of Bhopal started going to school but did not like wearing shoes and the struggle that uh, they, had to, right. they had with their teacher. It's a small film written by one of the children right. who's now an adult and uh, in college, etc. But her experiences then. There was another called uh, Jadui Machi, which is based in the banks of Hoshangabad, of a fisher community, and uh, but all through the eyes of children. And the uh, last one was Turup, which is actually a 
it's a film for everyone but it's a film on say the issue of love jihad and that was also based in bhopal so these are these two and i write etc right. uh, with children uh, one thing that i just want to share i don't know if, if it gets too long but uh, for example we run small libraries for children in areas where workers the coal miners live because i stay there the library runs out of my room and once we were having this class and where this small child was asking uh, they were talking about big people and how uh, so we were the, everyone was thinking about like important people rather than the tagore and the prime minister etc and someone was talking about something about their father and feeling angry because his father couldn't get him a new uniform and just in talking we were talking about um and how um that what does your father do so my father takes out coal and every day he goes and he works in an underground mine for 12 hours and what does he do he takes out coal so he said then where does the coal go so it goes to a power plant and then what does the power plant do it uh, uh makes electricity and what does that electricity do it lights up bulb and suddenly the child and everyone's whole point of view changed where he was thinking of his father someone not being able to provide to a position where his father is someone the worker of this country someone who provides electricity to the whole country so it makes him like a hero so i think uh, just yeah. an experience to share but that's the kind of difference between yes, like the two worlds of thinking yeah. yes that is that is that is a beautiful story that is a beautiful story the the films that you mentioned here if if our uh, young viewers would want to watch them uh, where can they access these films uh, they are all uploaded on youtube and vimeo so if they go to the ektara collective uh, youtube channel they'll find all the films there it's ektara okay. collective okay. Right. and uh, both on the vimeo and youtube channel they'll be able to access the films right Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, speaking of uh, speaking of films, uh, Ajaz Khan, are you there? Yes, hi. <clears throat> yeah. Hi, hi, Ajaz. So uh, when we when we were uh, getting introduced to each other, I thought you would be in Bombay. Then uh, I got to know that you were in Lonavla. That's right. So, uh, and uh, you you've been there since uh, since the lockdown began. So. Yes. Yes, that's right. right. So, uh, Jaz uh, directed the movie Hamid, which is uh, which is a a, a beautiful uh, story. Uh, I'm sure most of us have seen it about about a young boy in Kashmir who uh, who thinks that the number seven eighty six is the number to talk to to talk to God. So he he dials the number and and gets to talk to somebody on the other end and uh, thinks that uh, he's having a conversation with with God. And it's a beautiful story, but it also picks up a lot on uh, the political situation in Kashmir. Um, Ajaz, this is a question that, uh, that, that I've, uh, I've been meaning to ask you. The first part of the question is, how, how, what is it like uh, making a film uh, for young people, for, for children? What was the experience like? Okay. Um, it was a great experience. Um, uh, for me, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, that uh, I'm making a film or it's a children's film. It was a story which changed my my views. Uh, it was a story which uh, made me think in a different way. Uh, for example, uh, you know, thinking about uh, politics through a child's point of view. Uh, even, for example, take uh, the religion as, as such, where he thinks he has dialed and connected to God. I'm seeing the whole thing through that. That what uh, connected with me. It was a story idea. And, uh, you know, it was no way that I could think of uh, relating the story through an elderly person or an uh, older character. So one had to think of a child to do this. And, and that's how uh, this thing came up. Right. Uh, so it's based on an adapted screenplay. Uh, That's it's, right. It's based on uh, a play. It's based on a play by uh, right. Amin Bhatt. Uh, and uh, I haven't seen the play. Uh, uh, but uh, it was uh, just that uh, that one line which I got hooked on to. Uh, you know, a friend of mine called me from Srinagar saying that, okay, look, uh, 
he he watched a play and this is what the play was all about that a, a boy his parents are missing and he dials 786 it connects to uh kashmiri pandit so you know i mean i changed from pandit to uh, crpf jawan and and okay. that's how things came up yeah right right but that so that i have also... i i wanted to see the play but uh, yeah sorry but that difference but that difference between uh, di- dialing a kashmiri pandit and a jawan is also is also significant isn't it considering uh, considering yes it is yes it is but what happened was okay i had to base the story in today's time and uh, if i yeah. would keep that into a uh, kashmiri pandit so it would be based in say in the in 1990s or yeah. anywhere yes. at that time uh, when the yes. migration happened or when the pandits were asked to leave so there was a difference yes. that was a difference basically so right. i wanted to go with today's time and how things were today yes. so right yeah uh, right uh, just your uh, your interests as as a filmmaker are are also wide ranging i mean uh, we 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 talked about this and i will not give any spoilers but the current project that you're working on is at the other end of the country and uh, mm-hmm. it's it's about cast which also is uh, you know a political mm. issue in so many ways so mm. what is it like to deal with such uh, complex issues in in such uh, complicated uh, geographies well i mean geography is story yeah so geography or even uh, um, uh, you know uh, religion if you may say so it doesn't matter much when if the story is gripping so for me what matters is the the story and if you know you tell a story in a in a manner these uh, you know that is gripping that's what gets interest of the audience uh, that's what i want to say i mean as i was hearing this uh, you know uh, uh, rinchin talk earlier and she said things those those uh, those films i would love to go and watch those films and such beautiful stories where adivasi girl uh, she is suffering or or going through a problem to wear shoes you know to go to school wow that's such a beautiful thought i mean stories like this should be made into films so 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 it is it's nothing to do with the, the geography of uh, things or what uh, it's just a story which is dripping and that's what gets gets my attention right uh, how did you how did you get started uh, with cinema has it been a, a lifelong association fascination oh yes yeah it's been a uh, ever since i was born it's like my you know my family was in this business uh and that's how it has that's how it's got been uh involved in this business uh and now my daughter is also showing a lot of uh, interest in this and she is doing a lot actually so yeah that's how i am yeah yeah um uh, ajaz if you were to recommend uh uh films for uh, those of our uh, of our viewers who uh, are our young viewers who are interested in uh, in cinema as as filmmakers i'm i'm sure a lot of them are budding filmmakers mm-hmm. so as a, as a director which would be your favorite films that you could recommend to them see since we talking about uh, yeah since we talking about hamid uh, what got me influenced or uh, inspired to think of hamid was uh, life is beautiful so i mean that's that's one film which is stuck in me ever since and i can't just get it out i mean i think it is it is it it was a thought which uh, got me thinking to place hamid in this manner in kashmir so uh, that's one of the films and there right. are quite a few there are uh, there are films which uh, uh, yeah. like turtle skin fly sorry uh, for yes uh, i'm sorry uh, just to interrupt you. For, for for those of our young viewers who might not have seen uh, life is beautiful although i'm i'm sure most of them have mm-hmm. uh, it's it's set in the second world war it's set in uh, in in italy and it's about uh, that's right. a father and a, a son that's uh, right. in a concentration camp and about how the father tries to make this whole difficult and 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 terrible experience in a concentration camp how he tries to help his son cope with it deal with it it's a, it's a beautiful story i just thought i i i tell them oh, a bit that's really it. nice of you to do that because uh, <laughs> so like films like that i mean that is one film which really influenced me for hamid and then films like turtles can fly or bakers bakers is another good film that was that's a iraqi film 
it talks about two brothers they decide to okay. go and meet superman and uh, you know they are in iraq okay. and they don't even have a passport okay. so it's like how the hurdles which goes through just to to think of that they are going to meet superman because they happen to see superman in one of the what theaters what is the title of the film it's Sorry. called bakers it's called bakers b e k a s it's i think it is available BK. yeah it is must be i think it is on youtube you can find it on youtube it's a beautiful story and and the and the problems what they go through to just they just want to go and meet superman and superman is in uh, you know watching films of superman so they they think superman is in in uh, united states and how do they get there they have no idea so as they are crossing the hurdles and you know someone tells them you need a passport so he said what is the passport he said it's a booklet so this little boy goes in folds paper and makes that rights passport on that so he calls that a passport you know and he tries to so it's a it's a, these are the thoughts if you just see i mean that's the this young minds how they think and and that's what one of the dialogues which i have kept in hamid too that agar duniya bachon ki nazariye se ho to kitni khoobsurat ho exactly yes uh, So, so yeah, I mean, these and there are lots more. There are quite a few uh, films. Right? There's Children of Heaven. That's Majid Majidi's film. There's uh, the Blue Bicycle. That's a right. Turkish film. There's uh, Wajida, which is again, um, you know, uh, a film from Saudi Arabia. So where they talk about the culture and how they introduce culture to the, these young kids. So, so there are quite a few films. Even uh, in India, there are a uh, few good films where uh, uh, you know talks, which talks about all these things. yeah uh yes uh, which are your favorite uh, filmmakers in india across languages oh there quite a few so it won't be right or if i just say one i would say there's quite a few quite a few okay. i mean i i have been yeah. Yeah. um you know the guru that uh, i mean i'm talking about you're talking about the contemporary filmmakers or the uh, all of them yeah okay so there quite a few across the There's Satyajit Ray. There yes. is uh, Sham Benegal. Uh, there, there are um, K. Asif or even Raj Kapoor in that. And there are so many filmmakers who are. You could see the passion, um, you know, in watching their film. Um, in today's time, also there are yes. quite a few good directors. I there are. I mean, there are many actually. Yeah. I can I can hear the I can hear the passion when you are when you are talking about uh, yeah. talking. About. so uh, what are the other projects that you're working on if if we, if we can uh, ask you uh, without uh, spoilers of course yeah well uh, that's the script which i've been working on since a long time um, which change which talks right. about the changing of caste system in the early 20th century by this lady uh, so so that's what <coughs> currently which i'm working on um it took me some time to <coughs> excuse me it took me some time to uh, um you know to uh figure out how to write or think of stories <coughs> sorry <coughs> which are um you know the so called uh, you know or the early 20th century well it's difficult to do it yeah so so that's one there are a couple of other stories in this lockdown which i have uh, you know uh, you know uh, developed and which i want to get into uh, you know screenplay so So there are a few. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> right. Uh, so this one is early twentieth century. So it's also historical in many ways. So you'll have to recreate the period. And yes, that's right. That's right. Keep those. Well, it's not. It's not as much as difficult to create the uh, the era uh, because there are some locations which I have seen uh, which can be easily converted to uh, then or uh, that era. Uh, so it's something which is uh, it's. it's it's easy to do as such i mean i have because i've done my recce and uh, travel there so i think we can it's manageable it is manageable i have to find a producer i mean yeah. that's what the most difficult part is you know <laughs> so so that that is uh, yes yeah. that, that is quite another task yes. yeah but uh, but i hope you will be able to get back to the project and uh, you know as, as soon as things get back on track uh, and and we can all venture out All right. Fingers I, crossed. I look yes. forward to uh, this. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Thank Kenny, you. are you there? Yes. Thank you. Kenny. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. So Kenny is uh, is the second 
Victor on 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 our on our panel, and I don't know if uh, Kenny, you've met uh, Jazz uh, before in in Bombay or no? We haven't yet. We haven't. Hi, Kenny. <laughs> ah, I am beautiful. Uh, so uh, so Kenny's uh, the first thing is I've known him for the longest time, and I have uh, and I have uh, admired his works for the longest time. Uh, Kenny's work uh, covers both. He's he's a he's a writer. Uh, he's the author of the novel uh, Chocolate Guitar Momos. He's an actor. Uh, he's a filmmaker. Most recently, you'd have seen him in uh, Tigmanj Dhulia's Yara. Uh, very recently for me, uh, because I was trying to figure out how to watch uh, Z here. Uh, and uh, he's also a martial artist. So there are there are multiple uh, hats that he juggles uh, quite adroitly. And uh, so, uh, Kenny, I, I just wanted to ask you. Um, how did you how did you uh, venture into into cinema to begin with? You've always been interested in. It. Uh, so it started in class six, I guess. Um, I had a friend, Amit Lahkar. We are still friends, and uh, Amit, you must remember, I guess, from he used to be in Sankar Academy when we were in Cotton. So he he used to come over with. Uh, Cassette, a video cassette. We had a VCP, VCR in our place for that year, loaned to us by someone. So every Sunday he would come over with some film or the other, and we would watch it. And then mom would cook some chicken curry and pudina chutney, and then we would uh, have lunch and then watch the film, or the other way around. So we ended up watching a lot of um, time. We saw Terminator, Terminator 2, uh, The Fugitive, Blade Runner and um, um, Spielberg films. So I guess that could be, that could probably be my most influential period in terms of deciding what I wanted to do with my life. And we did quite a few plays also in school, skits, just some short comedy skits, which uh, became decently popular. So I guess that's how one would say I found my calling. Entertaining people felt good. So I thought, okay, this would be nice to do on a larger scale when I grow up. Which which you did, and and then you move to move to Bombay. You've had a career in in Bombay with uh, with mainstream cinema. You were you were there in Shanghai, um, and you also made films uh, in in uh, set in in Guwahati in in its own uh, unique world about which I I wanted to ask you in some detail. Um, you have a huge uh, fan following uh, in in the northeast, so. Um, one of the things is about representation when it comes to cinema from the Northeast for the longest time, especially, I mean, of course, cinema from the Northeast is, is quite diverse. So uh, it would be difficult to cover all of them uh, within the period of time that we have here. But uh, when it comes to cinema from, from Assam, uh, you know, there, there are certain things that, that you do differently. Uh, your your characters are are different. Uh, the, the the world in which uh, they they inhabit is different. The cuisine that you show is is also uh, markedly uh, uh, different in, in in many ways. And of course, there is the humor and there is the very high quality martial art uh, sequences that uh, that that are there uh, in in this uh, movie, for instance, local kung fu, which is which is which has become a, a cult uh, classic. I mean, there are memes on uh, local kung fu, which are very popular, both uh, among viewers from the Northeast and from those in the rest of the country who are interested in the Northeast. So in many ways, your cinema, the, the, the two local kung fu movies and uh, Suspended Inspector Boro, which was your latest film, they are introductions to, uh, to a, a part of Assam, a certain generation in Assam, both for viewers in uh, Assam and outside. So how did this, uh, this process uh, take place? I guess after spending about two years in Bombay, I realized that um, I ultimately wanted to become a director. So I realized that the only two ways to do it were either one to have to assist somebody for four or five years, but I'm too thin skinned to assist anybody. I wouldn't be able to stand all the if the director gets into a bad mood and takes it out on me, I wouldn't be the one to just quietly take it and say, okay, sir, you're right, sir. <laughs> uh, so that wasn't for me. And the second option was to have a Karodhpati father. And I made inquiries, but uh, 
my parents definitely didn't have money it was a little stacked late for that yes. on the in the backyard yeah it's a little late for that no secret walls in the house also full of cash so so um around at 2010 or so the dslr revolution had started and uh, cameras had become affordable the dslrs the 550d the canon 550d was what we found affordable and would uh, give us good enough quality that could be projected on a big screen so i had lots of friends at the time who were who guided me and of course there was youtube also so i learned a lot from youtube and um from the at that time the internet speeds weren't very high so with a little bit of patience i did manage to learn quite a lot from there and it was through a lot of trial and error that we started making our film and uh, we shot it over a period of nearly i think 6 7 months the first local kung fu i would shoot in guwahati for a few days and go back to bombay work on something there again come back so about after sh- juggling about 3 4 back and forth i managed to finish the shoot then after that it was about a year of editing and showing people and trying to take it to places and we got selected at the ocean festival and after that finally um durlov borwa a friend of a friend in bombay saw the film and thought it was good enough to invest some money in and help it release in theaters so that's how it ultimately got released uh a a a bit about martial arts because uh, there aren't that many uh, high quality martial arts movies made in india by uh, by our own mm-hmm. uh, by our own directors uh now you are a martial artist yourself and you you know wing chun kung fu and uh, and judo as well um not so much of judo i started out with wing practice a bit of the taekwondo kicks as well nowadays i last the last few years i've picked up um, mixed martial arts so brazilian jiu jitsu and wrestling and uh, muay thai so i've been learning all these and actually the more i learn the more i realize how terrible i was previously so every film that i do when i look back at it after a year i see good lord my technique was horrible <laughs> in local kung fu one i see the mistakes i've made while applying brazilian jiu jitsu techniques in local kung fu 2 i see all my bad body posture while trying out the wrestling moves and in inspector boro i see that my footwork and overall body movement could have been much better when i did my kickboxing parts so um i that's the thing the thing about me i guess is that i since i practice it myself i'm always learning and so i'm always excited to try out new things that i learn and uh, i'm not i'm not an expert by any means but it's just that i can sort of um when i do it it won't look terribly fake compared to some other <clears throat> actors of course of course and you wouldn't have to use so many jump cuts <laughs> no 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 we try to let the camera run as long as possible right but you you've also in the process of making these movies you've also got a uh, uh you know several young upcoming talented uh, martial artists slash uh, actors who have mm. uh, become famous in their own right so now you have uh, you have uh, what one may call an extended family of uh, of actors who, who are who are quite um uh can i there is a, there is a question that that uh, i've been meaning to ask you for a while um mm-hmm. and that is uh, when it comes to representing uh any culture or any uh, people from the northeast uh, there are these two and this is a question that i asked rinchin as well and this is a question which i asked in a in a slightly modified way to ajaz because it applies to to all uh, such uh, places in india there are just there seem to be in the popular imagination in literature or in cinema there seem to be just two ways of showing uh, are you there you, the video is uh, frozen yeah, yeah yeah can you hear me i'm here yes yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there seem to be to is of showing uh, uh, people by showing them as uh, you know perpetually caught up in con in the in the case of the north east it's about uh, the various music festivals and things that we have in the case of uh, central india indigenous communities it's about uh, struggle against uh, big corporations struggle over land 
or uh, dancing tribals. And in case of Kashmir, it's again about conflict or the, uh, the beauty of the place. But the lived experiences of it, the fact that there are other far richer stories to be told and they, they don't usually get told either by the media or in literature or cinema. Uh, how are you, uh, uh, I mean, how has that influenced you, the choices that you make as a filmmaker? Because your stories are about ordinary people living ordinary lives, except they all know martial arts. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Siddharth, frozen. Um, well, I guess while well, Siddharth takes his time to unfreeze, I might as well carry on answering. Um, I haven't really <clears throat> had a, a local Kung Fu. One, the story came about more as a sort of um, we took a look at what resources we had. We found out that we had these locations. We found out that we had these actors. We knew that we had one uncle, my uh, first mama, who is also a martial arts teacher. So he would have a major role. And then we had two of his students who were very good martial artists and who would make good villains as well. So we had them. And then we had my cousins who were very funny as well. So we knew that they would make good comic villains. And then we knew that we had these three mama's houses. We had this hilltop over here and we had this school ground over here where we could shoot. So the story became a function of the resources that we had available. So that's how we ended up uh, fixing the story of uh, Local Kung Fu 1. Local Kung Fu 2 happened as an adaptation of Shakespeare. There was a Shakespeare adapting competition for which we had to, uh, for which we had to write a treatment, I think. So I wrote the treatment as a, as a martial arts adaptation of the Comedy of Errors. And I submitted it. It didn't get through, of course, but when I narrated it to some friends and family, they found it hilarious. So when it was time to make a second film, I thought, well, why not make this? So that's how we ended up making the second one. And uh, as for uh, stories being about um, the conflict in our region, the issues are so complex. It's like nobody has dared to attempt attempts to address these issues yet. Um, there have been films addressing smaller aspects of it or just touching lightly on one small aspect, but nobody's um, tried to put together a big picture of sorts. And um, a fellow filmmaker, Bidyut Kotoki, he, um, I forgot where he said this, somebody said that uh, approximate films about conflict in an area are made about 30 to 40 years after the conflict is over. So that's one interesting observation. So since the peak of the conflict in Assam was the 90s and early 2000s, I'm guessing we'll have films about it in the 2020s, which is coming up now. Uh, anyway, I guess we should have Ajaz's take on this now. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, um, that's very that's an interesting take. Uh, if it is that uh, long, uh, then the films come out. But uh, as far as... Uh, uh, yeah, you know, uh, I, I do agree that conflicts do make a, a very good story, which, uh, you know, looked through a child's point of view. Uh, yes, it, uh, uh, you know, I mean, conflict, uh, you know, somehow actually not, I don't know. I mean, it's like, it's, a, it's something which uh, I wanted to show, but again, you know, to to show it blatantly or uh, with no restrictions, it was very difficult or so, you know, one molded in this manner, uh, tried to mold the story in a manner which uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, balanced in both ways. So, uh, so, so that's what happened actually on Hamid and uh, yes, uh, there, you know, while the, the process uh, which we, while shooting and, uh, you know, on the film, was that I happened to be in, in Kashmir for a long duration of time uh, while shooting and even before the shoot. So there were, uh, I think that year I must have visited uh, Srinagar at least four times, uh, different, different months. And mm -hmm. that's how one saw the, the beauty of Kashmir and Four Seasons and it changes in, you know, every way. But that, uh, the, if you, if you uh, at that period of time, when you analyze the locals, what the conflict has caused in the mind, especially children, which we're talking about, it's, it's very harsh. It's very harsh. So I have a, very, uh, a feeling that, yeah, these conflicts uh, should be uh, addressed in films because this is the best way to, to uh, uh, you know, showcase or talk about. 
you know, the, the, or, which shows the, the conflict. If, you, if I remember even, uh, uh, you know, one of this Hollywood actors, uh, um, she made a film, uh, which was, uh, oh, I, f- I forget the name now. I'm bad with names. But anyway, so but <laughs> coming back to the conflict, I think, yes, it, the, the, you know, stories do uh, affect uh, us, you know, uh, the film turns out to be even better, more powerful as such. Yes. yes. <clears throat> um, if I may just, um, uh, how I said, I, I had taken over for yeah, two minutes while your net was off. off. <laughs> it went offline so I, and I was trying to come. Yeah. I'm really sorry. I missed your answer completely. Please uh, no problem. There's one thing I wanted to point out and um, Rinchin especially, I guess, uh, would find this. Um, uh, there was a, the first question, the first poll, I think, was, have you seen a film set in a conflict zone? And uh, there is one film which I think pretty much everyone has seen, except that they don't know that it's in a conflict zone. And that would be Avatar by James Cameron. It is. Sorry. So, Hmm. yeah, (laughs) everyone has seen it, but most people will probably not understand it when it happens in their own backyard. Yes. into aliens and I'm in Hollywood, they probably can get it. So um, filmmaker Devashish Makhija, who has made uh, Ajji and Bhosle, mm. he, had, uh, he had started making a written a script or started making, I don't remember exactly which, a film called Unga, in which a tribal boy sees Avatar and says, this is exactly what's happening to my village. So he tries to I forgot exactly what it was, whether he tries to write to James Cameron or something and all. And uh, so Devashish Makhija even had uh, contacted, made contact with them, <laughs> with the uh, Avatar makers, but they, it seems they completely shut him down and said that you can't even mention the name Avatar in your film. So, <laughs> <laughs> the way it's up. Can I... Um... I just want to say something about conflict zone. Like one, we see also we see areas as conflict zone, geographical locations. And I think this question has been asked a lot of times that two children need to know about conflict. But like if you ask a Kashmiri child or you ask a child in uh, Manipur or even um, a child in Bastar, they're living with conflict. And that is a part of their life. But yes. apart from um, apart from geographical, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? we can. Yeah? Uh, uh, but apart from, uh, apart from geographical uh, lines, I think there is, um, to a large extent, there is conflict everywhere. There is the caste conflict that goes on every day in uh, children who live in, whether it's in urban city or whether whether uh, a child who comes from a bhatti, there is a conflict every day in their lives. And whether it is police coming into your bhatti whenever for a, for a child from a denotified tribe uh, or uh, being ridiculed in school uh, on terms of caste or in, on terms of the kind of uh, work or the work that the, the families do, like rat picking, etc. So I think uh, the... Uh, how children negotiate conflict in their everyday life, like even in a city, in an urban city, but it's the same child who's going to give his 10th exam and that child is being picked up in the night and taken to the lockup because on suspicion of uh, robbery because he or she belongs to a tribe that is traditionally seen as criminal tribe. So um, how we represent it uh, fleetingly uh, or not, in but when stories come from those contexts, when stories come from the, for example, uh, uh, when you were talking about recommendations that should have been better, like say something like Munu, the graphic novel called Munu that has been written about uh, and uh, is, uh, is beautiful, which talks about a child growing up in Kashmir with the conflict, or uh, say uh, work of Bama who is a Dalit uh, feminist writer who writes about, I mean, her stories are not necessarily just for children, but children would enjoy it. It talks about how caste affects our life every day in villages or in cities. Um, Thari Babu's book from Hyderabad, which also talks about uh, just the, just the um, idea of being, uh, say, uh, Muslim in, in the country now or uh, 
you know or all, all in a mix but see how does it feel that is work by uh, this organization called muskan that is been taking out stories by children themselves and what they write about life so it is it's like for example so conflict is not just uh, not just the geographical location but also every day because there's so much inequality there's always this context and you cannot when you write stories from those locations or you write or, or children children themselves right or you write of children or adults from those they bring in their context with them they will bring in their conflict with them whether it's gender or, or sexuality when you write about a young girl who lives in a certain place then you write about her conflict every day when she negotiates her way to school uh, and uh, and if she is yes. uh, adivasi or if she is muslim then there is a another layer that is added to it or if she is transgender and so then there is a whole, so i think there are layers of conflict that we uh, which we like uh, uh, what uh, kenny also said that uh, there are sometimes we don't even recognize those conflict when they are in our own backyard so i think for also young children who are listening and for parents who are listening i think it's important that we see how uh, how a lot of times how cruel we are to people not cruel but discriminatory and how discrimination works i think that is very important to identify and uh, and i think that conflict there's no way we can escape that conflict uh, in children literature and if we um, like if we take it head on we only become better people by recognizing uh, i i completely uh, i completely agree with what you are saying and uh, my take on this is that as you we were talking earlier <clears throat> is uh, see actually the conflict which comes to the children is through the elders the child doesn't know that that's a conflict you know he deals with it as a normal day to day life but it is the elders who push this that okay that's a conflict and that's what is a problem because it's like we elders shove down our thoughts to the children and that's how it is it's it progresses yeah so i uh, you know it depends on on what is conflict yes thank you those are great thoughts for all of us to come away with <clears throat> uh, i think it's been a in like a really rich exchange of books and films and ideas and creative processes i just want to step in here sadartha if that's okay yes um, yes. yes of course uh, the polls yes so we during the course of this this discussion you would have seen a few polls popping up on your screens um let me just share the results with you the first poll that we that we put up was have you read a book or a film set in a conflict zone and most half of the audience 48% said yes and it has left a deep impression on me what are the issues faced by indigenous communities um most people said that you are aware of and most people said land conflicts and alienation of tribal groups the other question that we asked mostly to test audience recall was in the film hamid um 8 year old hamid calls god to speak with his father what is allah's number and 100% of them got 786 <laughs> Uh, general knowledge not audience recall <laughs> all right, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. um our last question was which state has 17 tribes and 36 languages uh, in the northeast we had a split vote between nagaland and assam the answer that we have um, is nagaland is all of them <laughs> perhaps <laughs> that is all of them as well maybe that is general knowledge too can <laughs> we also have a really interesting question that's come up from a student in grade 2 for miss rinchin which i will just share with you in a minute miss rinchin i am from grade 2 and i have read your book i will save my land i have asked my grandfather to save his land for me so that i can get more water for farming have you also saved your land and cultivated it yeah unfortunately i don't own land but uh, in like the people that i stay with have a plot of land in the forest and they were so had to fight a lot to save it and are still fighting to save it so while it's not my land but i and uh, not always i won't uh, i can't lie but yeah sometimes i do help in uh, farming when i can and i think it's the uh, most uh, uh, i think it's 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 what probably all of us that we do and um, but the and um, 
thanks to you to for bringing it up because yeah everyone should have their land and that's the and that's the fight i think that's the conflict that most people are not able to own their own land thank you so much we have one more question because we have a few minutes left which i think might be relevant to all of the panelists i'll just share that with you this is a question from somnya menon how do we as kids born post independence authentically learn about these areas and by this i think she means the peripheries the areas of boundaries given that they are mainly used in the media for propaganda so that is she has made the one? conclusion about propaganda <laughs> <laughs> So yes, uh, Ajaz, can you ring in, please? Yeah. Reading, like. traveling, and uh, knowing the more the more you read, the more you seek out um, work and also information about these areas. And I think also it's uh, also about knowing and also the perspective. so the more we try to seek out work of people that we are talking about or i think um also travel and is it would be one way but i think reading and trying to uh, trying to form your own perspective looking around yourself also to see how um how this world works and uh, how uh, equities and inequities are created i think that would uh, But read the book, read read Bama, read Margaret, read Elizabeth, read Kabir Babu. Yes, there is there is a lot to read. Read a uh, book from Kashmir that are coming out. Munu would be a great way to start. The more you know, the more you question. The more you question, the better one's perspective is. I think. Thank you. For all the children, uh, can everything. can you which uh, which films would you recommend as as an introduction to Assam today? I wouldn't say the rest of the northeast because that would be a very long list, but. uh films about mm -hmm. about uh, contemporary assam i think the closest would probably be bornodi bhotiai directed by anupam right. koshik bora i've acted in it and um apart from that um i'd have to think a little bit but i think village uh, closest to reality village rock stars um yeah i guess one would say that it shows one aspect of one aspect of life in assam but um, as a sort of introduction i would go with something else okay we have okay. thank you kenny uh, could you tell us a bit about bornodi bhotia if if you have just a minute kenny sure uh, i'm Can sure our, our viewers would be interested is a sort of social satire it's set in majuli the world's largest river island its um, central characters are four boys they're all friends and they're all in love with the same girl so all of them try to woo her and in between there's a lot of other things also going on how they um, try to take advantage of various government schemes by setting up a goat farm and um, the girl she uh, some uh, some old neighbor comes and uh, gives galis for some reason and then she says sala ye budha mata kyun nahi hai the instead she says that he gets a heart attack and dies so word spreads around that iski zuban kali hai and stuff so it okay. got a lot of complex things and uh, it's told in a very um wonderful satirical way so it's a wonderful wonderful film i believe it's available on moviesaints.com now and should be available on realdrama.com after a while so that's one film i would recommend to people to see what life looks like in assam okay thank you so much siddharth and kenny rinshin and ajaz um we do have more questions that have come in but we also realize that we are running out of time um so we have really really benefited from this panel discussion thank you so much for taking the time out to be thank with you. us thank you thank you very much to the panelists thank for you. a wonderful discussion sorry i got blocked out in the No worries. No problem. I enjoyed it too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all for these uh, extremely informative sessions. Uh, we hope to go back to our daily lives with some great insights that we've gathered here. Um, Kamla Basin said, "I am not the wall that divides. I am the crack that is formed on it." 
and she urged us to share not only stories of conflict, but that of friendship and love with our neighbors. In fact, Mr. Shivan also highlighted that human existence has a very strong turbulent quality and once provoked can become violent easily. So we have a great responsibility to balance our stories. Couples sang of dreams and joining hands and bowing heads and praying for each other, burying our differences as love conquers all. Rinchin and Kenny both spoke about the importance of representation of the different worlds that exist in our country. And um, Ijaz said, Agar dunya bachon ki se ho, to kitni hoti. Um, so thank you for all these brilliant insights. At the Neve Children's Literature Festival and now Neve Online, we believe that discussions must be open and nuanced and filled with stories that people of all age groups will internalize in their own personal way. The dots will connect somewhere, someday, someplace. We believe it is our job through this platform to make everyone think and reflect and ask pertinent questions. Children are naturally curious and are great philosophers too. So the more we nurture their minds to expand and grow, the more they're able to navigate complexities. And that's the motive that drives us. We hope that authors speak to children in a way and manner that is not oversimplified or dumbed down but actually call for children to question, assimilate, reflect, rise, and grow. We hope that publishers help build stories for children that forge ahead and allow the lines to shift and move where required. And for readers and listeners, we hope that all of us lodge in our memories the special stories we hear and watch that help us navigate our lives in unexpected ways. And for parents and teachers and librarians to share these stories with children every day. The lines are after all only imaginary. Thanks once again for joining us here and we hope to share with you some exciting lineups in the coming weeks and beyond. The first of which we hope to reveal as book clubs for children presented by eminent children's author Ms. Ms. Veera Hirnandani, along with some author interactions and book clubs for parents too leading up to the International Literacy Day, where we'll discuss the role of children's literature and literacy. Thanks once again. Thank you so much, Sneha. And thank you so much to all our panelists and all of you who've joined us. We will keep putting up events and staging events for you, like Sneha has just said. Please do follow us on our social media handles, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter to find out what we're up to next. We hope to see you next time. Thank you. Happy Independence Day. Jai Hind.